I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account of him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Yes, Brian Denlinger did pass away in uh, January, I believe it was, of 2002. I've said for a while uh, that it was 2000, or when I was 25 years old, now actually I would have been two, uh, 26, excuse me. That um, was a mistake I made, uh, but going back over the pictures and kind of the timeline and everything else there, just that whole time period was kind of a blur of, of just a lot of events happening in my life, which I'm going to go over. And... Um, the thing of the Lord saving me. And uh, so I'm going to talk about four things here in this testimony that led up to the death of Brian Denlinger. The original one, the one that used to live back there that you just saw the pictures of. Um, you know, a lot of happy times, a lot of uh, happy memories, very worldly uh, memories. And uh, looking back, I was a professing Christian for most of that time. And uh, but what I'd read the Bible and of course I had NIV and a New American Standard Version. Um, and when I would read the Bible, first of all, it really didn't make much sense, but uh, you know, the Bible stories just seemed so foreign to me. And um, you know, I had the morals and the convictions and things of being a Christian, but uh, there was no connection really to God in that entire time. Um, but the Lord started to do some things in my life that led me to salvation, led me to the end of myself. I'm going to share those with you now. The first thing uh, that really kind of set me uh, to, you know, salvation, getting saved, um, as I've, I have another video out about uh, what, did I, what did I do for a living, uh, my past, my working past and things like that. And at the time I got saved, I was very heavily into logging, um, really loved to fell trees, cut timber and things. And um, I was doing, you know, selling to sawmills and also to, you know, doing uh, tree jobs for people. They'd have a tree that they want to take down in their backyard. And, and, um, and you can see it kind of carried over into my early part of ministry because I still I was posting logging videos. If you go back to the oldest videos on this channel before King James Video Ministries was started, um, I was posting logging and fishing videos. Those were two big influences in, in my life when I was uh, a lost man and coming into that point of salvation. And um, I was doing, you know, I mean, I, the whole channel name here is Husky 394 XP. It's the name of my professional chainsaw. And I'll, I'll be putting pictures in throughout this study. So there's a picture of it. Uh, it's big saw. And... Um, a lot of people, of course, would want my help because I was able to cut down bigger trees than most people could because my saw was a 94cc uh, Husqvarna and 42-inch bar. And, you know, you can figure out the rest. I mean, <laughs> big saw, cut down some big timber with that. But in that time period, I was also uh, working as a wood turner, an artistic wood turner, selling my work through galleries and and. I wasn't really doing as many art shows anymore. 
that was more in the past uh, leading up to uh, my salvation. But for years and years and years, as a woodturner, I struggled with the thing of trying to find the perfect finish for my work. And of course, there are some, there's different glosses and things like that. Uh, sometimes you make a wooden bowl or a other wood turn thing and a high gloss finish doesn't look quite right on it. You want more of a oil type of a finish. But I, get, I kept getting frustrated because so many of my finishes, they weren't very tough. I would have a, a oil and a wax finish and it would get spotted if water, if you walked outside with it and there'd get some rain on it or something, it would spot the finish. And the high gloss stuff was good, but it sometimes it wasn't food safe and and you know, and there was a lot of issues and I was always struggling with this thing of finding the right finish because I wanted my work to last for many, many generations. Again, as a professing Christian, I had no concept of the times in which we lived. I had, if you'd have said to me the end times or in the end times, I'd have, I'd have said, huh? You know, I had no idea. You know, church going, the whole thing, uh, professing that I had been saved when I was eight years old in Sunday school, and yet I had no idea that we're living in the end times. And I just thought, you know, well, I want my work to be there for people, you know, 300 years from now. Uh, just no clue about the time in which I was living. And I had also was studying a lot of um, getting into starting to study some of the old ways of, of doing things. I, I sort of, Lord showed me some of that. And um, so I started to study um, old woodworking techniques and things because trying to find this perfect finish uh, how did people do things in the past? Because obviously, if you want to find something that lasted for 100 years, well, what do you do? You go back a few hundred years ago and study what people were doing, woodworking, you know, woodworkers were doing back then. Are their pieces still around? What were they putting on them? So that was my thought. So I got into the thing of post and beam uh, construction. Timber framing is another way to say it, where you have the big beams and you have these wooden pegs holding mortise and tenon joints together and things. And, and these barns were many down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, and there were many of these barns standing for two, three hundred years. Um, and no bolts holding anything together, no screws holding anything together, steel plates or wooden frames held together with mortise and tenons and pegs through them. And uh, they just stand, and, and I'd been in them. Um, and, uh, I mean, there was there's structures that my ancestors built down in Lancaster County and uh, they're still standing, you know, two, three hundred years later. And, uh, you know, you walk into the thing and you walk on the floor. There's no bounce to the floor. There's no squeakiness. It just, these things are rock solid. You walk into them on a windy day and it, you can't even hear the building creaking. And uh, so I, I became fascinated with that. Started to study it and uh, I got called to do a logging job at uh, Sides Mill Road, I think it was called. And there was an old mill down there. And there was an older woman that she had had it, and she was in and out of a nursing home. So she'd live at her, the old mill, and then she'd live at this nursing home. And um, the mill had really fallen apart, and, and um, a lot of teenagers were vandalizing it when she wasn't living there. And, and they finally, they vandalized it, and they burnt, you know, part of the, the mill. So my older brother was there doing construction and uh, with his company that he worked with. And they were trying to fix this thing up and things, rebuild the roof and everything else. And uh, there was the, the mill, and then back behind it, there was an old barn. And this barn, I forget the year, but it was sometime in the 18th century, sometime in the 1700s, that this barn had been built. And the whole one section had caved in on this old barn. And so I was there uh, to cut some, there was a guy that was felling timber down there, another logger, and he wanted to know if I could come and help with some of the, the different uh, work there. And ironically, I, I couldn't help him with some of the trees he wanted felled because they were like on these real steep banks. And I was like, I'm not sorry, I'm not climbing the trees and topping them and you know, some of the work he wanted. I said, no, can't do it. But uh, probably about a month after I talked to him down there, he was actually killed on that job. Uh, cutting timber, felling trees uphill. One of them hit, slid right back over the stump he wasn't getting out from behind the stump. You know, you walk at a like a 45 degree angle away from the stump. And he just was standing behind the stump. The tree went boom and hit right up over the stump. And he was using conventional too, which is the angle cut up like this, not the Humboldt, which is down. So that doesn't help it to stay on the stump. 
if you understand some logging stuff there. And so he felt it up over the, the stump and slid right down and just hit him in the chest and drove him down the hill. And these are, these are big like tulip poplar trees that were like, you know, probably three to four feet in diameter, you know, 80, 90 feet tall. There's some really big timber down there. Boom, hit him, drove him down about, I forget what it was, 10 or 12 feet, just, just like a big ramrod smashing him down the hill. And uh, he died on the way to the hospital. And um, professing Christian, I don't know if he was genuinely saved or not. I didn't understand any of that back in those years. But uh, there was a this old barn. And I remember I walked into the thing and, you know, I'm looking around. And it was, I mean, there's there's some sloppy built timber frames that I've seen where the joints are not very tight and whatever else. And, and they're just, you could tell somebody really didn't know what they were doing. Or they'll deconstruct an old barn that was built correctly by an old craftsman. And then they try to reconstruct it and they don't do a very good job. The Amish are very sloppy with that. But uh, this barn was like textbook, beautiful. All the joints were tight. I mean, the, the mortises and the tenons and the, you know, just the knee braces and the, the trusses. And I mean, it was, it was beautiful. And the whole reason that part of it caved in was because the roof had a leak in it and this old woman didn't care. And she let the water just come in there and come in there and it finally rotted the beam and the whole, some of the beams and it, down it came. And part of the barn was laying there that had fallen down, the one wall had fallen down and the, the, the thing's still standing, even though a whole wall was down. I think they, they ended up tearing the whole thing down then eventually, but I walked over and there's this old kind of rotted mortise and tenon. These beams are, you know, probably 10 by 12. I mean, they were huge, big beams. And I reached down and I pulled this very wooden spike. I think the British call them tree nails or tree nails or something like that. But this wooden spike right here, look at that thing. That's over 300 years old, this wooden spike. And carved probably on a shaving horse uh, or whatever. But there's, it's got the little fine tapers on it and everything there, you can see. And I remember I held that thing and I thought to myself, this craftsman that built this barn, built this thing to last for hundreds of years, and yet the carelessness of one woman not fixing the roof, and the whole thing collapsed. And the thought occurred to me, you mean I could find that perfect finish? I could preserve my work, and yet some careless person could cause all that I'm laboring for to just waste away to nothing? I thought, huh. Then uh, what's the point of making, putting all this work into this art that I'm doing? And it started getting the wheels rolling up here. Then the next thing happened. Uh, there was a mission trip to Honduras. Again, professing Christian here. So I'm going to go down as a missionary, uh, go down to this village in Honduras. And I had a little ulterior motive there. Um, I actually wanted to find a Honduran woman because being in a uh, pervert at the time, as a lost man, looking at pornography, uh, I particularly was attracted through, because of my perversion, to Hispanic women. And so um, I'd met one years earlier and uh, just fell in lust with her. And uh, I thought, you know, I got to get another Spanish woman. They're beautiful, you know, and the, everything else. And, and so I thought, well, I'll go down on this uh, mission trip, but I'll also kind of keep my eyes open, you know. And, um, you know, so I'm a professional wood turner, working in logging and all this other stuff. So I went down with a group from uh, some churches there in, in the Ephrata area and uh, went down there to Honduras. And we stayed in a town called La Asequia. Uh, it's not too far from San Pedro Sula, which is the capital of Honduras. And uh, this La Asequia is basically a plantation town. Uh, I, think for, I think it was Dole um, that has all these banana plantations. It's huge, just hundreds of acres of them, you know. And then they have these little towns where they'll employ the people in the town to go work in the fields. And it's, they pay them almost nothing. It's, it's an insult. I mean, it's just terrible. And the living conditions were just really, really bad. I mean, dirt floors and these little huts. I remember there was division walls, you know, dividing walls inside these little huts. And the huts, probably the size of this 
my ministry office here, you know, which is not a very big room, probably um, maybe 10 feet this way, maybe 12 feet that way. And that's what people were living in, whole families. And uh, they'd have a dividing wall that was built. They'd just put sticks up and then they'd cover it with newspaper. And uh, so many of the houses, these little huts, you go in there and there's just, you can see just holes, termites just eating these houses and, and uh, children running around, you know, um, little children, no diapers on or anything, just, just run around. If you pee or poop, well, that's where you go. Um, people down doing laundry in the river that ran through the town, they're doing laundry and over here somebody's septic system is going into the same river and there's children swimming in the river downstream from where the septic goes in and just crazy. And we were going around door to door to these different uh, little huts and, and they would, you know, we had a guy there, uh, Edgardo Paz, he was raised in that little village. His mother still lived there. And he had a lot of, you know, siblings there, living there. And um, Paz's were friends of my family. And uh, so we'd gone down and uh, with them and, and we'd go around and they would interpret, you know, and, and we'd carry, you know, these little hygiene bags with toothpaste and, and uh, you know, like... Um, Neosporin and things like that, and some band aids and soap and whatever little things they needed, and then you'd give them this thing, and then you'd share a little gospel message with them or whatever. And uh, again, it really started to shake me up, and I started thinking to myself, here I am, you know, the back in America, I'm I'm in all these, you know, big high end art galleries and things, and and rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous and the elites and things like this, you know, making work for him. And, and um, I mean, the one time I had a call from a museum and uh, they wanted they wanted some more information on one of the pieces that I had made years earlier, a big wooden burl carving. I'll put pictures of it up. And, uh, you know, I mean, so there was, I had my work in museums and, and big art galleries and things all across America. And here I am, I'm this guy and I'm like thinking already I have the this story in the back of my mind of things falling apart and then I'm down here and I'm going okay what is the point of me as this guy making you know rich people richer <laughs> you know not only is my work not guaranteed to be preserved for hundreds of years out into the future but what's the point of me making this stuff to just you know because money was a big motivation in my life. I remember I was at the Wood Turning Center in Philadelphia the one time Albert Lakoff was the uh, head of it at that time. I don't know who it is now or if he's still doing it. Or, I have no idea. I've been out of the wood turning world for a long time. But I remember he asked me, he said, what's your motivation? What's your inspiration? And I said, making money. And it was because, you know, I'm thinking, hey, I can make a wooden bowl and in an hour get the bowl done and I can sell it for four or five hundred dollars in an art gallery. And there were times, of course, that I did that. Other times pieces, you know, they take longer to sell and things, but, uh, and I thought, you know, I knew the, the process by which you become a, you know, bigger artist and things, your work has to get better and better, and mine was, and you get into the better galleries, you get into the better shows, you make the right contacts and whatever. And so that was, you know, that's the direction I'm supposed to be heading in, bigger and better, more money, all that other stuff, and I'm down here living for three weeks. I was down there in Honduras, and I'm looking at this poverty all around me. And again, I'm just going, How can I justify this? How can I, you know, in my mind, you know, justify my life? What, what is my life about? Making rich people richer? It's kind of an empty life. And I remember coming, coming back in, and I think it might have been in. Uh, Houston down in Texas you know the airport down there and we flew back from Honduras to there and and we're sitting there waiting for the next you know our flight to go and and uh, had a little bit of a layover sitting there in the airport and I see this guy walking around and he's begging for money and he's you know I guess he was supposed to be a deaf mute or something like this got brand new clothes on brand new Nike sneakers gold chain around his neck and things you know I need help I need money and I'm just going you don't know where I just came from. I've seen real poverty. I've seen, you know, some rough stuff down there in Honduras. So again, 
you know, that, that kind of shook me up a bit. And another big thing that the Lord had happen on that trip was I met a, a guy named Don Fabula. And um, Don and me kind of hit it off, and we were, we were, you know, going around and trying to, you know, there are a lot of children down there in the village and stuff, and we'd play with the children and things and throw the ball around and things and, and whatever else. We had a good time. And Don started talking to me about creation science. And he started to kind of bring up some things about, you know, how evolution is just ridiculous. And, and uh, started to say some things, and I thought, yeah, it's interesting. I never thought about that before. And uh, it's kind of ironic, too, because um, there was a, a big thing down there. Franklin Graham actually came to Honduras when we were there in La Acequia. And everybody was all excited. Oh, Franklin Graham's here. Oh, you know. And uh, they were all going to take a bus into, I think it might have been San Pedro Sula, into the capital city. And they were all, like, excited and everything else. You want to go? You want to go? And I was like, no, I don't want to go. And, I, you know, if you'd have said, uh, you know about Franklin Graham, don't you? The Catholic connection there. He's friendly to Catholics just like his dad was. I would have been like, no, I had no idea. I didn't know that Catholics were bad at that point in time. <laughs> I was completely ignorant. I was lost. A lost professing Christian. But I remember there's just something I was like, I don't care at all about this Franklin Graham guy. I don't want to go see some rich evangelist that's down here to take people's money from him. Again, I didn't even understand all the implications of what the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association is all about. But some seeds were planted, you see. And some, you know, the wheels started turning up here again. So I come back to America, and now I'm going... Okay, my work can't be preserved for hundreds of years. No matter how hard I work, I'm not guaranteed that my work is even going to last a hundred years. Um, this creation science stuff, this is kind of weird. And I'll say this, uh, part of the time that we were down in Honduras, we stayed with some missionaries. Um, I think it was Tegucigalpa that we were down there and they were, you know, in that area. And uh, we stayed with some missionaries that we had met, my parents had met years ago, um, that uh, uh, he was at the church I grew up at, Calvary Monument Bible Church, and um, Bill Parker was his name. And so we went and stayed with them for a little bit of time before returning to La Acequia, and then that was the end of the trip. And because um, they needed us, they were going on some thing going away or whatever else, and so they needed, uh, my parents had gone along on this trip, and so they needed my parents to watch their children. And so I was like, you know, you know whatever, I'll tag along. And um, so we went down there uh, to watch with their children and everything else. While we were there, my older brother Dean and his wife, um, they had gone to Papua New Guinea as missionaries. And uh, another big story, I'm not going to get into all that, but they had gone over there and... They it did not work out. I mean, my brother Dean is would be one of the worst people to send to a place like Papua New Guinea. They just fell for a lot of the propaganda. They went with Wycliffe uh, Bible translators and uh, Jars, I think it was as well. Jungle Aviation. I forget what that stands for. J A A R S. And uh, so they had gone over and they actually left and returned um, back to my parents' place. And so. He was telling me as well about this Kent Hoven creation science evangelism and some of the creation science stuff. And Don Fabula as well knew about Kent Hoven. He, I think he was uh, also listening to some other guys. Um, I know he, he had the uh, Defender Study Bible by Henry Morris, and he was watching some of his stuff too. I have one of them here someplace. Um, yeah, it's here somewhere. I've showed it in other studies, but... Uh, so, again, this creation science was getting to be kind of a big thing. And so we came back to America. And by the way, I did meet um, a number of different Honduran girls down there and things. And, and uh, the one, you know, it seemed like it was going to be serious. And it just did, you know, the, the Lord just went and stopped the whole thing. Again, I didn't understand the thing of uh, marrying, the inter interracial marriage and stuff. I didn't understand that uh, back when I was lost man. So I was very much into the idea of integrating. Um, but again, that's another issue. So came back to America, and my brother was there 
with his wife. They had you know, needed a place to stay, so they moved back to my parents' place at the time. I was living at my parents' place yet. Uh, had a big house and things. Most of my siblings had gotten married, moved away. So I was just kind of there taking care of their place, you know, for them and stuff, doing a lot of the work that my dad was um, not able to do as much anymore. So my brother was there. He had the uh, Ken Hoven Creation Science Evangelism series. And uh, I don't support Ken Hoven anymore. He's really going off the deep end. And, uh, you know, actually in his affidavit talked about the whole purpose of CSE was the ecumenical movement. Again, we have a video, you know, proving all that stuff. But the whole point is, at the time, this was the first time I ever heard anything about creation science evangelism. And in the fifth video, video number five of his seminar thing that he used to give, um, he started talking about the thing of the new world order and the one world government. And this really kind of woke me up to that whole thing. And I thought, what in the world's going on with this? And this would have been, I think it was the winter of 2001 when this whole thing had happened, the, the missionary trip. And then, you know, coming back and, and I started watching these videos uh, through the spring of 2001. And so I started to really research and I started to study and things like that. And I got into a lot of the conspiracy realm and, and all of a sudden I'm realizing not only is my work not going to last for hundreds of years out into the future, it's not guaranteed to, but I don't think we're going to last a hundred, couple hundred years out, out into the future. I mean, <laughs> and I started waking up all, to all this different stuff and um, just started to really look for truth, just started to really research. And, um, you know, Ken Hoven talked about the thing of, of uh, the NIV, verses are removed from the NIV. And I remember I paused the video and I went upstairs and I got my NIV and I looked up Acts 837 and it's not in there. And I'm going, okay, this is weird. And so I went and um, I got, originally I got a Zondervan King James Bible. Uh, I'm not sure if I still have that one or not, but uh, we moved then. Um, we had a, a move, you know, I moved with my parents up to um, Kleinfeldersville, uh, a place there. And um, we were, you know, I was staying there and, and, uh, and they had a clay bookstore and I went and I got this Cambridge Bible from there. And um, right before we moved, actually, the childhood home that I grew up in um, on Peach Lane in Ronx, Pennsylvania, uh, we had originally lived out along the road. And then my parents sold it to another family called the Raps. And then that's been sold since then. That was many years ago. And then my, my dad bought six and a half acres back in the woods and uh, built a house back in there. And that's where we grew up. It's five children in my family. You've you know, seen the pictures of a lot of that. A lot of those pictures were taken there at that property. And, uh, you know, the birthday parties and everything else were between the two houses, the one out at the road and then back in. And, um, you know, so I grew up there from the time I was three years old up until the time I was, um, yeah, it had been 26, 26 years old. So, so, you know, been there for a long time. And uh, the day my parents actually settled for the house, they sold it to an Amish family. Um, the day that my parents settled for the house was September the 11th of 2001. The infamous, uh, you know, terrorist attack in uh, New York City and everything there. And um, so that day was kind of really a wake-up call for me because I was kind of looking at all this conspiracy stuff and all of a sudden, boom, 9-11 happens. And I started thinking, okay, this is, you know, I was believing the, the propaganda from the news and I'm going, oh, this, you know, Muslim terrorists and things. And, and uh, but it was just like, okay, there's a few things that I'm wondering about here. Why are the buildings falling down? What's this building number seven all about? No airplane hit it, it fell down. What's going on? I don't understand. I had all these questions. And it didn't take too long. I was on the internet and it didn't take too long. And it was like people started coming up with, well, why this, why that, and all these questions. And I'm going, hmm, I think this stuff I've been studying about conspiracy, uh, I think that there must be an element of truth in it. And so it, again, it prompted more studies. So we moved from my childhood home up to 
um, the, the new place in Kleinfeldersville. And uh, I remember the, uh, you know, I'll say it this way, and, and that is that um, when I was going through that whole transition, uh, like I said, I went and I got a King James Bible, this one here, this Cambridge King James Bible, still use it to this very day. And, uh, and I remember becoming convinced that uh, the King James Bible is God's perfect word, it's perfect written word. And I started reading it like crazy, uh, just really started to study the Word of God. And um, it's ironic because a lot of people call me a Ruckmanite and things like that. And I jokingly say I'm a Ruckmanite. But uh, the very first words I ever heard from Peter Ruckman were actually in this book right here. The very first thing I ever read from Ruckman was in this book right here by James White, <laughs> attacking the King James Bible. My oldest brother, Tom, he was in the pictures. Uh, he actually, you know, let me borrow his copy of that book to dissuade me from this evil King James only thing. And it just further convinced me that the King James Bible is God's perfect word. And, uh, but as I was studying the word of God, I, I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, I don't have anything in common with these people in here. I can't relate to this book. I don't, I don't understand. And at this time too, I should add that my the art gallery stuff I'd pretty much pulled all my work out of art galleries and I had a few you know plastic totes of some of my bowls and wood turnings and whatever else and most of those I just just given them to people here you want this go take it you know and I just kind of stopped the whole uh, woodworking thing for a while because I just I was like you know what I don't even care about a job or whatever right now I just, I need to work some things out in my mind and uh, so I don't remember the exact day I don't remember um, when it happened but I remember I got really 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 scared and I just thought to myself the words just kept going in my mind if you die today do you know for sure where you would go and I for the first time in my life I thought you know what I don't know I really cannot say it for years and years and years. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm going to heaven. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. But I'm reading this book and I'm going, I don't think I'm a Christian. All the stuff that they're going through and the things that they're saying and whatever else, it, I can't even relate to it. You know, back in my lost life, I'd make fun of the word fornication. I'd make fun of other things that I found in here. And I'm going, wait a second. Why was I making fun of this book as a Christian? That doesn't make any sense. And I started thinking to myself, you know what? I don't know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And I'm sick and tired of this life that I have, this, this art world and all this other stuff and this endless, meaningless pursuit of toys. And I'm going to be doing a separate video on that, the thing of uh, my history with motorcycles and cars and trucks and, and all that stuff. Because uh, that was what my life was for many, many years, uh, motorsports. And uh, I had a lot of different things and, and stuff and I'm like I said I want to be putting this in a separate study but I show a lot more pictures of that stuff too but just looking for happiness in those things and you get that temporary little new toy happiness and you drive it around and you show all your friends and you show off and you go racing with it and stuff and go speeding and you get that adrenaline rush and and after a while it wears off and you go I want something faster I want something more powerful I want something that can go off-road better or something that can you know it's meaningless, absolutely meaningless. So I came to the end of myself. And um, it was truly like I died. It was sometime January of 2002, looking back at the whole thing now. I did not record the day. I didn't, I didn't know to write it down and the time and whatever else. And, and it really doesn't matter because uh, I know the Lord saved me. And when he saved me, it was a total change in my life. And all of a sudden, you know, I was, I was a cool uncle. You know, I'd take my um, nephews and things for a ride in my Corvette. And, and I'd come in on my, you know, Ninja ZX-11 I had back at the time. Um, it was the fastest bike on the road back when I had it. The Hayabusa came out after that. And then there's other bikes now. But, you know, at the time it was like the king of the road. You know, and I had one and it was built and everything. Again, that'll be in the testimony vehicle testimony video um, 
lessons learned from that whole lifestyle. But, uh, you know, I was a cool uncle. I was really cool. And all of a sudden, uh, Uncle Brian doesn't have the motorcycles anymore, and Uncle Brian doesn't care about the motorcycles anymore. All he wants to do is just talk about this book. And all he does is spends his money on uh, books and videos. I don't have my videos here right now, most of them, but, you know, all this stuff here and everything else. And I'm just, just learning and learning and studying and studying and studying. And uh, that lasted for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, during that time period, um, my parents had been looking for a good church to go to. And we were, uh, there's Brubaker Valley Road, I think, um, near uh, Lidditz, Pennsylvania. And uh, not too far from Kleinfeldersville. And uh, I remember we were driving along and I see this Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I'm thinking, hey, uh, at the time I'm thinking uh, Ken Hovind's a Baptist, um, Sam Gipps a Baptist, Peter Ruckman's a Baptist, all these different guys I'm studying, they're Baptists. So I'm like, well, praise the Lord. Baptists are Baptists. They're all Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing, the whole deal. <laughs> you know, a little ignorant. So... I'm thinking, you know, I said to my parents, hey, why don't you go visit that place? You know, it's, it's a Baptist church. And they were like, well, you know, I've heard bad things about the Baptists. Ah, oh, come on, just go. So they went, they checked it out, and I was still kind of doing my study thing. And um, so they came back, oh, yeah, it's really good and everything else. And, and uh, so I decided I would go visit with them sometime. And so I went. I remember the first time I went, I had jeans on and, and just sneakers, and, and I had like somewhat of a, just a you know, collared shirt, like a lot of what I wear in my videos now. And um, I just was, you know, devouring as much as I could on the Bible and, and everything else. And and so uh, it didn't take me real long, and I started saying, you know what, I think I need to be wearing a suit and tie. So I went on full-on Baptist, independent fundamental Baptist. Uh, a lot of those old videos are still around. Here on my channel I'm not going to delete things and try to cover up what I've done in my past and things I now disagree with uh, this you look at this this ministry you'll see the process of sanctification the Lord's done in my life so you know I went out and I got this I went to Goodwill bought it my first suit jacket was four dollars you know <laughs> I was all excited you know well I got a suit jacket and and I think my dad had a tire so or whatever else that I could borrow and and uh, or maybe it was my grandfather I think he might have had one and I was excited about that. And then I saw these, you know, ties with the, like the Ten Commandments on. Again, watch my oldest videos. You'll see me with these ties on. So I was all excited, you know. I got into dress shirts and dress pants. And, and I got a new pair of logging boots, you know, because I was still doing some logging on the side. I got a new nice pair of black logging boots. I still think I still have those. Um, but uh, I'll tell you why I don't wear them in the future in another video. But... Uh, you know, so I'm all excited, you know, and I, I'm looking like a real militant Baptist here and kept my beard trimmed real, real short, you know, and real perfectly trimmed and everything else. Watch the old videos. And, uh, you know, I'm there and, and the, the uh, pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church was a man named Dr. Arnold Killinger. He was a Ph.D. from, um, Oh, was it Tennessee Temple or Dallas Theological Seminary? I can't remember which one of the, the two, but he was a Ph.D. And, and uh, you know, I was talking to him about the Bible version issue because I'm just so excited and things. And I'm bringing in my materials and I'm showing him things. And uh, these, I remember these were two of the ones I showed him right here. Early Manuscripts in the Authorized Version and uh, Early Church Fathers in the Authorized Version, uh, both by Dr. Jack Mormon. Right there, there you go, right there. And uh, I remember I showed these to the to Dr. Killinger, and you know, and I was just going over some of this stuff. And did you know this? And did you know that? You know, and this this you know fairly young guy. I was you know at that time I would have been uh, I, birthdays in July, as you saw at the beginning there. So I might have been 27 or so at that point in time. So I'm all excited about the Bible version issue, and and he said, you know, and they were. King James only, and um, I remember he said to me, uh, you know, would you like to teach a Sunday school class on the Bible version issue? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to teach a, a class on the Bible version issue. And so Gail Ripplinger had this thing, a transparent 
uh, translations, I think, and she sold the overhead projector things. I got them filed away someplace right now. You know, these clear things with the ink on, and you put them on the overhead projector and it goes up one deal. So I got all prepared, you know, just went all out getting all the different stuff about manuscript evidence and and um, different things like that and how some of the newest finds in the papyrus fragments actually prove readings in the King James Bible and how the Nestle's text has not been updated to match that. And so, you know, I'm at this Baptist church and here's a deacon sitting over here named Chuck Taft and he was a graduate of Lancaster Bible College and then there's another guy over here, um, Bathurst, I can't, can't think of his first name, it might have been Craig, but uh, he's sitting over here at Bob Jones University. We're all Baptists, you know, I'm thinking, hey, this is great, I got all these King James Bible believing, you know, I didn't really know the term yet, I was just kind of King James only Baptist and so I'm teaching and I see the I see them back there and just like glaring at me. <laughs> I'm going, I don't know, you know, I'm ignorant, naive. And um, so I get done and the deacon, Chuck Taft, comes up to me and he says to me, I think what you're doing is very dangerous, what you're teaching. And I was like, okay, uh, well, what do you mean? And uh, And he said, I think I think that uh, you don't have your facts right, and 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 he got all mad at me, and I said, "Well, I used to use an NIV, and those things are satanic." Oh boy, his face turned bright red. I remember, and and, and he was like, "Well, some of my professors used the NIV at Lancaster Bible College. How dare you say those things?" And all of a sudden, I'm going, "Wait a second, this guy's a deacon at this Baptist church, and he's upset that I'm attacking the NIV." And they stipulate in the Constitution that nothing but the King James Bible can be used. You know, starting to get a little bit of an education, in other words. So, um, it went, I was supposed to do, I think, four weeks of this teaching on this Bible version issue. And the fourth week, I became aware that Chuck Taft was putting pressure on Arnold Killinger. And uh, right in the middle of my study, I was trying to talk about um, why I believe the, the King James Bible is God's perfect word. And what I was, my outline is actually in my About Us thing on KingJamesVideoMinistries.com. So you can actually see the outline of what I was teaching that Sunday morning. Um, that's where it came from. There's notes that I wrote there. And right, you know, in the, in the middle of what I'm saying, Arnold Killinger puts his hand up. He says, yeah, I just want to make a point, though, to everybody that's gathered here. The King James Bible is just a translation. It is not God's perfect word. I mean, you talk about, you know, just kind of making a, an issue there. And I'm going, okay, this is not good. You know, how can I finish what I'm saying here? Because that was my, that's what I'm leading up to, that it's God's perfect word. And you can rely on it. So I'm like, oh boy, this isn't too great. Okay, well, it's one bad Baptist church. The others are fine. <laughs> well, naive. So the one Sunday... At home, and there's a paper and things, whatever, like local, local newspaper. And I see this uh, Berean Bible Church ad, and it says King James only, old fashioned, old time, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, well, I'll go check that out. So, went to uh, Berean Bible Church, the pastor, his name Kelly Sensnig. I actually have a video debunking letters back and forth between myself and him, so you can tell where that one went. But I go there, and he had, I think it was, I can't remember the exact number, but I think like 60,000 some books or something crazy. I mean, or 40,000. or It was ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the library this guy had, all these books. You go down in the church basement, and it's just bookshelves. Just, you know, you think this is a lot of books. This is nothing. And he had all these, all these books, you know. And, you know, ever learning, yet never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And, um... By the way, I should add, before I got saved, one time I walked out of my wood shop at night and I looked up to heaven and I said, God, I know you're there, I know you're real, and I just want wisdom. I forgot to add that little detail in there. James chapter 1, verse 7 talks about, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. I couldn't have quoted that to save my life, but I asked God for wisdom. It just reminded me of that thing there. But you had this Kelly Sensen guy, 
And so I'm going there, and it seemed conservative, a little bit more conservative than Cornerstone Baptist. More people in suits and ties. I thought, well, this is good. This is more reverence and the whole thing. And and um, again, started talking to him about the Bible version issue and uh, about some of the other conspiracy things and whatever that I, you know, Lord was showing me some things there. And um, whatever, I'd written a little booklet. I do not have, I don't think I have a copy of it here right now, but I wrote this little booklet on the Bible version issue. Printed it out myself on a computer, you know, folded the pages over, stapled it and everything. Then I got into some of the conspiracy stuff in there about the New King James and they using the Tricatro on the front, this witchcraft three-pointed star. And uh, so he said, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about your booklet sometime. You know, could you come over to my house? He lived in Lincoln outside of Ephrata. So, yeah, sure, you know, that's great. I'm all excited, you know, because I'm, you know, into the church thing, the church structure deal. And so I go over there and um, he's kind of laughing and snickering, you know, kind of like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I know you mean well and everything, but, you know, uh, a lot of what you're saying here, you know, it doesn't really line up with the Greek and things. And, and, uh, and you know, I've seen that uh, the Strong's, you know, Greek and everything else, um, you know, it's some of your definitions are a little bit wrong and stuff. And I said, yeah, but the Strong's Greek doesn't come from the Texas Receptus. Hodges and Farstad, that's their text. And I don't think he realized I knew that because his, he kind of went from the ha <laughs> ha to Oh, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the Texas Receptus, you know, um, and, and he kind of tried to backpedal a little bit. And uh, and I was just kind of like, again, I'm going, uh-oh, you know, here's this guy that claims to be King James only. And yet you meet with him in private and he corrects and, and he would correct it from the pulpit all the time. Now, the Greek word here actually would be better translated as. And it was ironic because when he would trans, when he would say it should be translated as, um, like he would say candlestick in, in the book of Revelation should be better translated as lampstand. And I'm going, lampstand is what the NIV reads. And he would correct the King James and give a better reading, and it was the NIV reading. And I'm going, wait a second here. You know, is this guy a Bible believer or isn't he? Or King James only at the time I would have said that. You know, and... Um, so I'm going, oh boy, I can't do this again. In the meantime, my parents had been going to Cornerstone Baptist Church. They left there and started going to a Baptist church in Denver, Pennsylvania, um, called Mount Zion Baptist Church. Keith Schweitzer was the pastor there. So they're saying, oh, it's great and everything else. You ought to come over here. So I'm like, well, I'm not getting anywhere here at the Brian Bible Church. So over to Mount Zion. And this whole time, the Lord's showing me stuff. I'm reading book after book after book after book, just just studying and, and listening to preaching, all kinds of stuff. By this time, I had you know, really gotten into Ruckman's material and uh, was really learning a lot there. And uh, so, go to Mount Zion Baptist Church. And I'm there, and I get into the you know, little in crowd and stuff again because young man, single guy, you know, studying the Bible like crazy, knows a lot of the facts and figures and whatever else. And so... Went to the pastor's house, met with him personally, and we got to talking about it, the whole thing. And, and he was a Bob Jones University educated and, um, you know, had said that he came out of that whole thing. And an older man had showed him some of the stuff that he was taught about the Nestle's text being superior to the Receptus and all the other stuff, uh, you know, was, was wrong. So he was, you know, a King James only now, firmly. And, um, but in reality, he was Texas Receptus. Uh, again, I think he was a friend of D.A. Waite. D.A. Waite is a receptus guy. He does not believe the King James Bible is perfect. He says you're cultic if you do. Uh, again, I have D.A. Waite's book uh, right there, Defending the King James Bible, one of the first books I read on the issue. So it's kind of funny. It should be Defending the Texas Receptus, but another issue. So I start going there, meeting with Keith Schweitzer, and I said, hey, by the way, what do you think about Peter Ruckman? And his exact words were, I remember it to this day, he went, <laughs> he goes, ah, I hate that guy. And I'm thinking, you hate that guy? You know, and the Lord's like blessing me like crazy watching Ruckman's stuff and I'm learning so much and everything else. And this guy, this Baptist pastor tells me, he says, I hate that guy. You know? And again, I'm learning this stuff. This is 
years, over years, you know, and uh, I'm going, okay, this is kind of weird. Uh, you hate your brother in Christ. Because I knew Ruckman was saved. You know, this guy here, I'm like, I guess he's saved. I don't know. So, talk about the Bible version issue. And he says, hey, I'm thinking about doing a, a Sunday school series of, of things on the Bible version issue. And I'm like, can I give you some material? I'm not going to be able to teach, you know, or whatever, but I let me give you some material. Yeah, sure, that'd be great and everything. So, I, I get a bunch of my new versions and I've... I marked the pages where he can show and read the verses, you know, read how crazy these translations are. And I said, you want to borrow my Nestle's take? No, I have one. Okay, fine. Do you want to, you know, borrow this, borrow that? And here's, you know, I have an original revised version from 1881. Um, I have a American Standard Version. It's not the 1901. I think it's a second edition, like 1923 or something like that. I've showed those in other studies. Um, you know, what do you need? I'll, I'll provide you with all you need. And I remember I said to him, I said, if I can just give you some advice, Pastor, um, don't get into the real technical details, the cursive versus unseal and minuscule, majuscule, all that. Stuff. Just leave that stuff there away. Get it to the people that these are different Bibles from different parts of the world. Alexandrian versus Antioch, you know, Syrian, the Receptus. Alexandrian is the Catholic one and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that'd be good. First week shows up, and he starts going off on cursives and on seals and all this other stuff and whatever. And I look around, and I saw a bunch of people there. Their heads are looking forward like this, and all of a sudden I see the they're going, kind of like looking out the window and things, and I'm just going, what are you doing? And, you know, wasn't very good, and he you know, didn't even really do much of a job on the whole thing. And, and uh, so I was kind of getting irritated with that. And, again, I'm like, you know, going, can we get attracting ministry started? Oh yeah, well, we got this old uh, printing press thing, and maybe we could start doing some tracks. And I'm, and I'm saying, you know, is there some kind of a way we get some books in the lobby here? And can we can we start, you know, getting this tracting thing going and and you know, writing our own tracks and getting stuff out there and, and information out there? Yeah, well, we you know we might check into that. And I appreciate your fervency, brother, and all this other stuff. And uh, right in the midst of that time period. They uh, came out and they said, we, um, we need to have police background checks for anybody that teaches Sunday school. And my parents at the time were, were there and they were, you know, uh, looking into the thing of teaching Sunday school and whatever else. And my dad just flipped out about that. What is, you know, secular police, why are they being brought into the church setting to do background checks for Sunday school teachers? It's kind of wrong, and and again, I was aware by that time of the 501c3 thing, the government incorporation of church buildings, and I'm going, you know, uh, okay, background checks to teach Sunday school, chapter and verse. Ruckman taught me that. I thank the Lord for that. That's one of my favorite sayings now. You know, chapter and verse, and it really started to dawn on me. You know what? This whole King James only thing. The King James only world is filled with some of the biggest, most crooked people I've ever met. You know, I mean, they're a step better than the new version people. They're just, you know, lost. But because I was one of them for 26 years, I said 25 in the past, but after looking at the whole thing, that no, was 26 years. So I understand uh, what the whole new version thing is about. But I'm thinking this King James only thing, King James only. And I thought, you know what? It really needs to be King James Bible believing. And I started to hear some of that. You know, are you a Bible believing Christian? And I kind of thought, King James Bible believer. I like that. So I started calling myself King James Bible believer. I'm a King James Bible believing Christian. Okay. So when I heard the whole thing of the background check there at Mount Zion Baptist Church, I said, I'm out of there. I'm not going to be part of anything like that. Just no way. And I uh, actually wrote a letter to Peter Ruckman about that whole thing and uh, sent him a, a wooden bowl that I had made out of lignum vitae and a little, I made him this little uh, ornament and uh, I don't even know if I have any pictures of the thing, but it was a little, uh, not an ornament, it's a fishing lure and it was a little, little Pope standing there like this and he had a hook coming out here and a hook coming out down at his feet and then the little 
I, I screw up here that you could put your fishing line on because I know Ruckman like to fish. And so I made him this little Pope, you know, fishing lure. And I said, this thing works good for catching suckers. <laughs> so a sucker is a type of fish, you know. I wasn't implying, you know, yeah, Catholics there. It's a joke, you know, you laugh about that. So I sent him that and everything. And, and uh, I got a call from one of the uh, guys down at the Bible Baptist bookstore down there one of the brethren, and he, he said, yeah, he said, you know, Dr. Ruckman really liked your letter and things, and he'd like to publish it in the Bible Believer's Bulletin. So I forget the, the exact time period when that whole thing happened. Uh, I have it. I kept the newsletter. And, um, you know, so uh, I have it in my file someplace. My letter to Ruckman, he published the whole thing. And they, they put a little thing in there that they disagreed with me on, you know, the whole thing of background checks and stuff, which whatever. And he, he said, do you mind if we put a little thing in there saying that we don't agree with you? I said, yeah, do whatever you want. But I said, I don't agree with it. I don't think it's New Testament. I don't, I don't think it's right. And he said, yeah, but he said, you know, we've been having some problems with, you know, child molesters coming here and stuff, you know, to PBI and whatever. And Brother Donovan's been, you know, catching some, you know, guys messing around with pornography and whatever else. And, you know, and again, I thought, well, sure, but, you know, some guy has to get caught before he's on record. And the police will catch that. A lot, of, a lot of the child molesters haven't been caught yet. So the system isn't even foolproof doing police background checks on people. But, you know, it just kind of shows how bad things really are. So, so I left Mount Zion and I thought to myself, you know, um, it's ridiculous. I go to these church buildings and every week I'm there faithfully attending, trying to be there every time the doors are open, the whole deal. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of these things, you know, these Baptist churches that I'd gone up going to up to that point in time we're really not doing any kind of door-to-door -door evangelism or street preaching especially not street preaching they weren't really doing anything like that i think brian bible church had a uh, tracting ministry that they would do like the effort of fair and they'd have like their little things set up there and they'd you know offer tracks to people and while the pastor's blowing up and making elephant you know balloons or not elephant but the balloon animals you know for children and then they give them a tract or something like this. But that was the extent of the ministry I, you know, ever saw outreach ministry. It was always, you know, invite people in, you know, for a certain reason, you know what I mean? So, uh, so, you know, I'm going to these churches. I'm trying to get involved. I'm trying to do something for the Lord with, with all that he's been showing me. And, uh, I remember, Though one of the last times I was at Mount Zion Baptist Church, the women, they had special music and the women all stood up and they sang some song and I can't tell you what it was today. I don't remember, you know, I never heard it before. And it was about God looking for a champion or something like this, a man to go out and fight for him and go out there where nobody else was willing to go. And I started crying and I was just like, I'm here trying so hard to find some pastor that I can be under his authority and do, you know, he can just kind of direct me and study this and we'll write a tract on that and do, and it was the first time the Lord kind of went down out of heaven and put his finger, boom, on my head and said, you do it. Don't be going and hiding behind these church buildings and these pastors and whatever else. And I'm going, me? You want me to be in ministry? Uh, no, you're confused, you know, and it was just, you do it. I heard that song and it was just, well, I don't know if I can be a champion for you, Lord, but uh, I'll try. And I'm not learning anything going to this church building stuff, so I think I'm just going to go home and I'm just going to spend what money I have and I'm going to get as many Ruckman videos as I can and as many other videos as I can and and reading books from the past and Heroes of the Faith and and just as much stuff as I can get crammed into my brain I'm going to learn as much as I can. And it was about a year, I think, that I didn't go to any church building. And I was just doing little odd jobs here and there, cutting firewood, uh, you know, there's somebody needs a tree cut down or whatever else. Or um, I really was not making very much money at that point in time. I was just obsessed with the Word of God. And uh, so... Um, a lot of time went by, and a guy, a young guy that I had met way back at uh, um, uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church, 
His name was Derek Stoll, and uh, Derek and I became good friends. He was a he was very much into you know firearms and stuff, guns and and we'd go shooting guns together and and things. And if you've seen the my video where I shot the television with a, a set me rifle, <laughs> uh, I put that in one of my studies. And Derek was there with me, you know, and, and things. And we just, you know, we, we hung out together and, and stuff. And uh, um, so he he comes to me the one time. And he'd, he'd stop in every once in a while and just, hey, how you doing or whatever. And by this time, I had rebuilt my uh, a wood shop at my parents' property. And uh, I was making some wood turnings and things for money again. And uh, nothing real, real high end, just kind of local craft shops and whatever else. And uh, so he'd stop in, you know, we'd hang out in my wood shop and things and, and uh, we'd make stuff and, and whatever. And, and um, he said, hey, he said, I'm going to a new church. It's called Liberty Baptist Church. It's, you know, there outside of Ephrata up on the hill. And uh, there's some really good guys going there. Some, some guys that are street preaching, some real militant guys and a real good crew of guys going there. And I'm like, no, nah, brother, no, nah, I'm done with church building the whole thing I'm so sick and tired of it. and he's and he said no really these guys are you know bible believing christians i mean these are these are good guys no no he just just come and visit okay <sighs> all right all right i'll come i'll check it out and uh so i remember there was a guy that some evangelists speaking there and they had like this vacation bible school thing was ending that week and so i went and uh you know, got my old suit and tie out, my whole Baptist outfit thing, and went back and uh, went in there. And um, it was there I met Jesse Dulesky, who later was with me in uh, Bible Believers Fellowship. And um, Jesse Dulesky was going there. He was a, uh, working for a fire alarm company at the time. He was, uh, I don't know if you'd call it retired, but he had discharged from the, the Marine Corps. He was a sergeant in the Marine Corps discharged and so he's going there he's you know militant on fire for the lord had gotten saved he's there um there was a brother named marty harwood and a street preacher he's going there militant bible believer and there was a few other guys i'm not going to get into all the whole all the names and things but those were the two guys that made the biggest influence had the biggest influence on me and marty was you know a little bit taller than me yet he was a real big guy and his wife was there, and uh, they had, at the time, I think they had seven children. And uh, so they have a bunch more now. I haven't heard from Marty in a long time. But uh, he was probably the biggest influence on me in my time there. And I saw, yeah, this this is different. You know, this is something, um, there's something different about these guys that, that are there. It's the same atmosphere, the whole Baptist church thing and, and whatever else. Um, the pastor at the time was Guy Mosebrook. And, you know, same a lot of what I had seen there before, but there was a there was a more of a spirit there of being open to truth that I had, you know, that I wanted to talk about and other people were asking questions and whatever else. So I started to attend there. And um, I remember, you know, I had my truck at the time. Uh, I, I had it on the back, you know, if you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? And then believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved underneath it. Still have it on my current vehicle out there. Same bumper stickers. I got them from Ruckman's uh, Bible Baptist Bookstore. I remember the one time I pulled into the parking lot. And I'm sitting there getting ready to go in, getting my Bible and stuff together. And Marty pulls right up beside me, looks over and grins at me, and he goes, Heaven. And I said, Huh? Because you know, my mind wasn't on the back of my truck. And he goes, Back your truck, brother. Come on. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but he... He did a couple different things um, that really started to make me think. And uh, I remember one of the things, um, I had a chip on my shoulder for a long time about the thing of Baptist women, you know, conservative, you know, uh, women like that, wearing dresses and skirts all the time. I thought, oh, okay, when you go to church, okay, you wear it there, but then you don't need to when you're out of church. And uh, Marty's wife really convinced me, her name was Angie, she really convinced me that uh, that's the right way for a woman to be. Uh, she was a very godly woman. And they talked to me about this whole thing of this modest apparel and everything, and she, she shared a little bit of her testimony with me and said simply that, you know, she was 
very much trying to control the marriage and everything else. And she just, she got to a point where she said, you know, I'm going to submit to the Word of God. I'm going to do what the Bible says. And it says modest apparel, shamefacedness and sobriety. And she said, long hair and things, you know, and, and she said, I'm going to be a keeper at home, like the Bible says. And I'm going to submit myself to my husband as unto Christ. And she said, I'm going to live by the Bible. And their marriage showed it. Uh, they were just a really neat couple to be around. And I was still kind of, well, you know, I don't know, kind of going back and forth. And he said to me, brother, he said, let me ask you a question. Did women 100 years ago, did they wear pants? No. He said, what about 200 years ago? 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Why all of a sudden are women wearing pants today? Huh, yeah. And he said, are we in the end times? Do you believe we're in the end times, brother? Yeah. He said, do things get better or worse in the end times? Uh, <laughs> didn't know what to say to that. And um, so... That was a big thing he convinced me in, the thing of modest apparel for women and, and just the thing of seeing what a biblical wife is all about. And I remember he told me, he said, we're really praying that God brings you a Bible-believing wife. And that was many, many years before I met Catherine. And uh, you know, I had no idea. I mean, I was a single guy at the time. And um, so his prayer was answered. But uh, another thing that Marty did for me was... Um, the one week, he said, hey, we're going to, going to be out street preaching. I have a friend of mine coming named James Lyman. You know, and uh, if you've seen any James Lyman's videos on YouTube, he's a pretty strong character. And so uh, I, didn't, I wasn't there. I didn't go out to the door-to-door -door thing. It was fairly early on when I was starting to go there. And uh, so I show up that Sunday morning, and here's Brother Lyman there. And, and uh, I remember... You know, he he started preaching on different things, and and uh, I remember he, you know, he said later, you know, Marty told me later, he's like, yeah, he's like, Brother Lyman really went off, you know, because he said he could just feel the whole place was just really apostate, and um, so he, I remember sitting there, you know, and and James Lyman gets up on the front pew, and he's standing up there, he had this big walking stick, you know, because his back, he said his back was kind of sore at the time, and. And so he's up there, and he's holding the walking stick up, and he's just screaming, you know, and stuff. And, you know, if if, if you're not going out door to door, if you're not trying to witness to people, and you're not preaching on the street, what are you doing for Jesus Christ? And he's yelling and screaming, and, and I'm just, you know, sitting there in my seat going, whoa, you know, and uh, this is pretty strong stuff. I've never seen anything like that. You know, some guy up there standing on the front pew, you know, screaming at me, and everybody else that was there. And, you know, and so, uh, you know, he said about, you know, they had the altar call thing there at the end, you know, about going out and serving the Lord. So that was the first time I ever responded to one of them things. Unscriptural now, I realize, but at the time, you know, where I was at with the Lord, I'm, you know, studying the Bible a whole lot, and I'm thinking I'd like to do some kind of ministry or something. So I went forward, and I knelt down, and, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to be more active in trying to be a better soul winner in the whole deal. And, um... So, you know, and the whole purpose was dedicate, rededicate yourself here and you come out and, and do the door-to-door -door thing. And, I mean, it was a whole bunch of men went forward that Sunday. And so the next week, Saturday morning, go out door-to-door, -door, you know, show up such and such time. So I'm thinking, man, it's going to be like a whole bunch of people going. So I show up the next week. I was the only one of the people that went forward there. You know, none of the other guys that went forward came out to the whole thing. And look out for that all recall stuff. So I started going door to door. Faithfully, you know, the whole deal. Um, suit and tie, going out. And a lot of times I'd team up with uh, Brother Desi Dulesky and we'd go and we'd knock on doors. And and uh, and it wasn't a, would you like to come to Liberty Baptist Church? You know, the thing. It was, that was at the end. And uh, Brother Jesse really had a heart for really wanting to see people get saved. And so he'd go through the thing of, uh, if you died tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? And, oh, I think I'd go to heaven. How do you know that? And, you know, there was no, let's just lead you in this little prayer. Can you? Would you be willing to say this prayer and pressure him into the thing? Nope. If there's no conviction of sin, you know, I'll offer him some literature. They don't take it. Say, okay, have a nice day. Go on to the next place. You know, and we knocked on hundreds of doors, 
you know, doing the whole Baptist thing of the Jack Hiles method, which I found out later Liberty Baptist Church was actually a spinoff of, it was a Hiles church. Jack Hiles had actually preached in the pulpit there, which I thought was cool at the time. You know, I'm preaching in a pulpit that Jack Hiles once stood in. Oh, you know, little did I know. And Jerry Falwell, too, had been there back in its glory days. And so, you know, we're going there. And um, at one point in time, uh, Marty Harwood and, and his wife and their children, uh, they announced that they're leaving the area. They moved back to Michigan. And so that was kind of a real downer for me. I was really, really enjoyed Marty's company and, and I was uh, really had some good times. We went out, you know, on the street as well, different times. And uh, so then the, the three of us that were left was uh, myself, Derek, and Jesse. And I'll put up a little video here of, of uh, the three of us going out street preaching. I'm holding a sign and, and the video camera. And as you can't really see me, I'm, I'm just the guy behind the camera. But uh, I can just put up, you know, I'll put it up here. I'll stand there like this and I'll stick it here. Okay. Um, you know, so I had, you know, I went out and did the street preaching thing. I, there were times I was using the bullhorn and stuff like that. So I did do that. And um, we got, just, I mean, the three of us, we would just talk about the Bible and they would kind of laugh about it at Liberty Baptist, and they'd be like, well, these three young guys, you know, they're so fervent for the Lord and things, and other people would kind of try to join in on our conversations and whatever. And, but I mean, we'd, we'd stay there sometimes two or three hours after they closed, you know, Sunday night, just talking about the Bible and talking about whatever. And around that time, I was starting to get into the studying the whole house church movement. What's this whole house church thing about? And, you know, I already had known about 501c3, but I didn't make the connections that incorporated churches, um, you know, I understood that that's bad, but I thought, well, then you can just unincorporate the church and still have the church building. But I didn't understand the church building's not even scriptural. And the house church stuff, I started reading, and I'm going, wait a second here. I, this is weird stuff. Yeah, where is the altar call at in the New Testament? Where is the suit and tie thing? Where's this? Where's the how can I call myself a Bible-believing Christian and yet do all these things that don't appear in the Bible? 